Um, my husband and I were not planning to get um, pregnant at the time. We were planning to get married and we got pregnant before um, our wedding. And this was in 2018. So it was three years ago. Um, and of course we were so excited and so surprised and we moved up our wedding especially when we found out that it was twins uh we were like oh my gosh if we you know we don't do this soon like i'm gonna be huge and i won't be feeling well and um so we decided to move up our wedding date it's like all very exciting and i remember a few days after we found out it was twins um we i went home and like two days later i was bleeding a little bit and i was just, so nervous and made an emergency appointment went back in and like all was fine they're like it was great and like just that first moment like I'd only known for three days I had twins but it still was like so devastating to me and I was so concerned that there could be something um and then fast forward we um went to maternal fetal medicine um doctor so they do all high-risk pregnancies and when you have twins or any type of multiples, it's automatically considered um, a high risk. But my husband and I are very healthy, we're very active, and like we certainly didn't have any concerns and no one else had any concerns. It's just part of what you do um, for, for multiple pregnancies. And, uh, or when you have multiples in your pregnancy. And the, the ultrasound technician comes in and we're chatting and she's excited and we're excited. And there's a chance that we might be able to um, find out if it's a boy or girl, um, like find, find out the gender. But more than anything, this appointment was just to make sure that the babies were healthy and it was a normal appointment. This is what they do for all folks who are pregnant with multiples. Um, so we're chatting all as well. And then she kind of gets quiet. She says that's just having a difficult time doing it. And then after a while, I was like, is everything okay? And she said, you can talk to your doctor about it when she comes in and then leaves. And I remember looking at my husband like, that's so weird. Why couldn't you just say like, yes, and then leave? Like there was not even um, the slightest thought that something could go wrong. Then the doctor comes in and she says, listen, normally this early on, I don't confirm whether like the gender of the babies just because it's quite early and we wanna make sure that all organs are in place before we get anyone excited. And we would hate to go back and say like, oh, actually, you know, it's a different gender. She's like, but in this case, um, it's important that we let you know that you are having a boy and a girl and uh, your daughter has um, a number of different health complications it looks like and she listed off the various things that could be, had a sheet that she had us look through that talked about what, it, you know, different things that they think it could be. And she's like, the chance of survival is very slim. And if she does survive, uh, she'd have a very short life, would likely cause an early labor, which then puts your son at risk. So you have an option right now to have an um, uh, amnio, which is already like a controversial procedure because it puts the baby at risk, but it's even more high risk for twins. But we had to tell her right then. Um, and then that went into, you know, it's, so that would, that would let her know what specifically was wrong with the baby. So we would know um, what our best next steps are. So we decided to do that, but it was obviously a very scary choice and challenging. And we only had like two minutes to decide. And if anything went wrong, we could have lost both babies. But, um, you know, they reassured us that we knew what we were doing. And um, yeah, so that was the first, that was the first appointment um, before many. So an amnio can be a, um, it's a, an option for most uh, women who are pregnant. And basically it's this long needle that sticks into your stomach and it goes into, uh, I don't know if it like goes into the, the sac or it goes into a certain spot that like basically detects, it takes a little bit of cells from the baby and detects what's happening. So it will let you know, if there were any, if there's any health issues, um, whether it's chromosomes or heart or um, brain, like it, it tells you all the details that you cannot get from an ultrasound um, because it is so uh, scientific, it can get, um, there, there's risk involved. Like it could, there's a slight chance that you could, um, you could lose the pregnancy, but it's pretty low. 
But for that reason alone, a lot of women opt out of it. And we were like, yeah, we don't need to risk it. Like, again, we're healthy, nothing runs in the family. Um, so like, we wouldn't have chosen that for us, um, especially because with multiples, the risk is a little bit higher. After learning that, you know, our baby girl was sick, um, it was really either you do this right now, because if you come back for a later appointment, it becomes more dangerous. So you have to decide in this exact moment if this is what you want to do. Otherwise, um, otherwise you can just like see what happens. But what she told us, she's like, you can see what happens and like not go any further. But again, it might um, cause a very early labor, which the chances of both babies surviving would be very slim. And it put, you know, it definitely puts your healthy baby um, at risk. Obviously we were devastated. Uh, we were very excited to have two babies. Um, we had even recently, someone had sent us very early on like a double bassinet. And so just like seeing some of these things and we had just moved into a house. And so we were getting the house together and the nursery together. We don't have everything, we don't have cribs or anything, but we had some stuff coming in like that, that twin bassinet. So it was devastating. And then talking about what the options were, and we were like, listen, if the baby's sick, but she and our son will both survive, like we're here for it. Like we're, we'll do whatever is needed so we can have both babies. And um, that wasn't the issue. Like if, if it was her having downs or the thing that she had now is trisonomy and, but that and a number of other things. And it's specifically in girls. So we're like, listen, if she just has that and like, even if she has a shorter life or if it's gonna, you know, she's, she won't be able to do everything that everyone is able to do. Like, we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. And almost just like desperately, like as long as nothing else comes back, if this is it, like, great, we're here for it. Um, and then just sad, it's just like this joyful moment and also stressful. Like we, um, my husband and I were like fairly new in our relationship and we're suddenly like pregnant with twins. Then we have a sick baby. We're playing a wedding. Um, and like the wedding obviously like went by the wayside. We were like, this is not what's important to us right now. Um, but it was just a lot of life happening at once. Like these big conversations and moments that typically, I don't know. I mean, you're never prepared for it. Um, but we learned a lot about each other very quickly. And it was really, it was really hard. And we basically were just like in a waiting zone, waiting for um, the next phone call to find out what happened and just hoping and praying that it was just like this one condition that she had, which would allow us to have both kids. Yeah, so then we got phone call after phone call after phone call. Um, the Basically, uh, the cell that they grabbed went to a number of different labs. And so we got all these different doctors that were calling us based on their specialty. Um, and with everything that they had said, um, more than likely it would cause an early labor. She would not make it to birth. They were very clear on that. Like if she did make it, maybe an hour or two, um, but it would be an early labor. It would induce an early labor that, that would put our son at great risk because they are twins. The likeliness of him suffering because of this and likely not making it because of so early on and they'd be extra small because of twins that like some babies when they're born early, there's still like a chance of survival but because they're twins and they're just like naturally smaller and they're sharing so much. Um, it just It just was not likely. And, uh, I don't even remember, like, I, it's funny because as you're asking, like what specific conditions, and everything, I think I just blocked everything out. Like we just got so many, um, I don't remember the terms for everything, but she had a heart condition. She had chromosome issues. She had brain issues. It was a, a number of different things, um, that she just didn't have, she didn't have a chance but we really wanted her to. And I remember just hoping that like every doctor was calling the wrong family. They're like, there was a mix up. There was just, they, it's so funny. They're all calling us. Like it, it must've been, um, I was just hoping and praying that like it was the wrong family. And we were like the next phone call was them to be like, oh my gosh, so sorry. It was a different family. Their file was right next to yours, like easy slip. <laughs> and I really was like living in that, uh, like denial world for a while, like there's a chance for this, but it was, 
yeah, it was really devastating and having to share the news over and over again because everyone was so excited about twins and I just kind of shut off for a while. And so when people would call to be like, how are the babies? You're like, here we go again. <laughs> Once you found out that baby girl wasn't viable and the likeliness of her surviving was um, a very, very low percentage. And again, if she survived, she'd probably um, only live for a couple of hours and would put our son at risk. And he, if she survived, he likely wouldn't. Um, then came the option for the reduction. And the reduction, it's, it's literally called a reduction because it's not technically considered um, an abortion is when you leave and you have no pregnancy. So why we'd still be pregnant um, in the world of abortion, it falls under it, but the, the terminology is just different because you walk away and you still have a baby. Um, so the, the next step was talking about the reduction and we had a little bit of time for that. I think we had like five or five to seven days to kind of think that through, which felt like an eternity and not enough time all at once. And again, I was just like waiting for that phone call to come in to say that like they slipped off and it was the wrong one. But the reduction was the option. They gave us a specific time frame um, and really a specific date, but like this is when it has to be done because you can't do it past a certain date. It makes it more dangerous. And weighing the pros and cons of which is more dangerous for both babies. Is it to have a reduction, um, which still puts my son at risk, um, or is it to go through the pregnancy uh, when they were both be at risk? And for us, it was like, thank God, like we having to make that decision was just so horrendous. And um, it's just, no one should have to be in that. No one has to have to like choose one of their kids and have to decide without knowing for sure and like suddenly being briefed on all these um medical conditions that we were unfamiliar with like what makes the most sense now that i'm on the other side of this i am confident that we made the right decision um but in the time there was just so much guilt and fear and shame and curiosity of if we had it right and did it right and um what if all the doctors were wrong with all these specialists? We probably talked to 10 to 11 different doctors. What if all of them are wrong? Obviously that's not, that's not true. Like they are, they've studied this medicine. <laughs> they are like, they, they know what they're doing. Um, but of course we're just trying to think of like any way out of this. So when we went to the reduction, um, I didn't want anyone around. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't, like I had some friends who asked if they could stop by afterwards or I had a best friend from high school who wanted to fly in. I was like, no, I don't want to see anyone, just me and Kevin, or just me and my husband. And um, that's that's it. Um, it. I just felt so, I just felt so shameful and awful. And like that we were choosing this, which I'm so glad we had this choice because I wouldn't have my beautiful son today. But so awful in the moment, moments of that, this probably all lasted about a month um the reduction my husband was not permitted to be in the room with me for a number of reasons one they need to really focus on me because you have to be so specific um to make sure that you don't harm the other baby and that you do it you know correctly with the baby that you're working on and two just because it could be so much more emotional for me and i remember being in the room and just like sobbing and the doctors were very kind and very compassionate they're like you know women can do hard things like women are remarkable and we're badass we can do hard things like men couldn't do this men couldn't do this and I'm like yeah that's true also I don't want to be that strong person right now this is just awful and but it was like these four as a doctor like these three nurses and they were fantastic because they're just like women we do all the hard stuff like our bodies are capable of these amazing things and we are capable of these amazing things and you will continue to do these you know incredible things because you're a woman like it is a superpower that men don't have um and i kind of like like the feminist views of this too <laughs> um but then i calmed down a bit but was still kind of softly crying and once they were trying to start the procedure that's when the tune kind of changed and they're like you need to stop crying 
because it's moving your belly and you cannot move. So you need to stop. And just kind of this like, be like, oh God, like now we're just in like surgery mode and need to, and I don't know these people. Yes, they're really nice and all the badass feminists talk. But now I'm just like, I don't know these people. I'm just like cold, gross room. I'm doing this horrible thing. Felt like a horrible thing. Uh, a screen was up where they could see both babies. So they're like, do you want to see it or no? And it's like, no. So they turned it, but I could still kind of, and then like hearing them talk about it all, they couldn't do the procedure. Like they tried for a while and it's painful. There's a, and again, like a needle that goes through your belly. And it's taking a very long time. It was not comfortable. I could not move. Also just all the emotions and they couldn't do it. And they're like, well, we think your bladder's too full. So you need to go to the bathroom and then come back. And I had all like the goo on me. I was bleeding. I was crying. I was like half naked with this gown and just kind of like hobbling down the hall to go to the bathroom to just get strapped in all over again to this whole thing all over again, um, which was like 15 minutes the first time. And then I don't know however long the second time, but it just felt like an eternity. And then to like have to get up and do this again. And then the second time they were successful and I hear them talking over me, um, confirming that her heartbeat wasn't there and then confirming that his was but like confirming and triple confirming that like there was no heartbeat for her and it was awful it was awful um and so procedure was done um and my husband rolled me out of the wheelchair and it was just and like all these people congratulated us on our pregnancy and it's just like embarrassing and it's weird because you know the people who didn't know what to say were like well at least you still have one healthy baby it's very different um the rest of the pregnancy it's there was like a little dot where the needle was and as I got more pregnant the dot expanded and so it was like every time I looked in the mirror there was this reminder of like this big mark that like showed what we had done and that was awful too because it wasn't like a second to get away you know to get away from it it was like anytime I looked in the mirror I was like looking at my belly there was always that reminder of like there used to be two you did this um but now that I'm not pregnant it's not there anymore which is great be there forever <laughs> eventually disappeared um and then the next week we got married with a reduction <laughs> um it is an outpatient procedure and they're literally taking a big needle and they're very carefully poking it through your belly into the fetus um and it's stopping the heartbeat it is quick um and the baby does not suffer and um then you go home and i think there were some um like things i need to do the next few days to take care of myself i just don't remember what it was like all of that is just kind of my my coping mechanism is to block everything out <laughs> so i don't remember all the ins and outs of it i think it's really interesting with two pregnancies because i think that was the most challenging part is that you're experiencing joy alongside grief and so it's constantly a battle if I'm feeling too joyful about my son and feeling shamed and guilty about my daughter, if I'm feeling too sad about my daughter, I'm not feeling great for my son. And this idea of like trying to find this in between is such an interesting thing that I'm, while I've experienced grief in my life, I don't think I've experienced it in this way where it's both at the same time. When my husband and I arrived at the waiting or at the hospital, um, we didn't go to the waiting room. We checked in. <laughs> And I think we might like stood there for a moment and then they brought us back. They were really, really kind and they were really supportive. They knew this was very hard for us. Um, and our personal OB had been really supportive through all of this too. I mean, after we saw the MFM doctor and then we went back to our OB the next day, <laughs> she cried in the room with us and she's like, I have, you know, don't usually cry. I don't, you know, I've seen a number of instances and she's like, but I just know you both. And after, you know, these appointments and just love you when you have your, you're getting married as soon. And like, you should be playing your wedding and focused on that and welcoming your twins and not going through this. And so she gave us her personal number and was wonderful and just a big support. 
And I know that she had called these doctors, like she said at the entire appointment, so we didn't have to do anything. Like she took care of all of it. She just said, this is where you go. This is what time to arrive. So there was nothing that we had to do. And then I know that she had spoken to those doctors. So they also were just being really, really gracious and really kind. Um, and it felt nice to have them feel like they cared about us. And um, they gave us time. They were clear and direct in what was going to happen. And I think really the only, I don't think, I, I don't think we waited and waited. I think we just went filled out paperwork and went right in. And if we did, I don't even remember it. I just remember being walked out and um, yeah, I just like wanted to like shield my eyes and face from everyone. <laughs> I don't remember the going in part except for that they were very kind. Yeah, I was about um, halfway through. So um, like 19 weeks. We had a lot of support. I think more than anything, people didn't know what to say. And one of my sisters who had had an abortion um, very late in the game due to, um, oh, now I'm blanking on the specific term, but basically she had a hole in her heart and she had a hole in her brain and um, that she was not viable. And it was so devastating for her. And she had my, my, it's my half sister and she's much older than I am. So it had happened, I don't know, like 15 years before me uh, or longer, probably, you know, like 20 years. So she, you know, would check in a lot um, and share her experiences. And so if folks had had like a miscarriage or like in my, you know, my sister's situation, um, they could empathize a little bit more. For folks who just like couldn't understand, they tried to be there, but there's just, it's hard to understand. And um, they would want to celebrate the baby. And I was like very clear for a while that I don't want to talk about the baby. Uh, I would try to find clothes that hid my pregnancy. Whenever people asked if I was having a boy or a girl, I'd basically just cry. And um, people were supportive and they were kind. Um, I also just avoided people for a while. And I think a lot of folks would just like, you know, send something nice, but just, what do you say? <laughs> and it's just like a weird, it's a weird in between of like, you lost one, you have one where are you at today? But I just avoided people. Um, I worked from home at the time, which little did I know, I'd just be working from home forever. <laughs> but I worked from home at the time. And um, when my husband came home from work, we just like hang out at home. Sometimes we did things together. Sometimes we did things separately. He likes to be on his own to process things. I like to be with people. So like it was hard the nights that he wanted to be by himself. I'd usually had a best friend that lived 20 minutes down the road so sometimes I just drive to her house and we just like walk on her block and sit in her couch and cry um and yeah so it was I just didn't I'm very social and this was the first time where I just kind of like shut everyone out until I was ready and at my wedding um ground rules were not to talk about pregnancy <laughs> but after the procedure um, I'm still pregnant with both babies. So one just continues to grow and one does not. And I gave birth to both kids. So my son came first and my daughter came second. Um, she was of course much smaller uh, because she was 18, 19 weeks and the fluid was lost from her. So that made her even tinier. Um, but yeah, that in that scenario, it's, it's giving, cause you, yeah, it was giving birth to both. When I understood that I was going to give birth to both babies, um, obviously my first thought was like, how do I handle the birth? And my doctor said that you can hold her if you want, or we can just kind of like, you can have your baby boy, we'll place him on your chest and we'll take her. Like you can decide what makes the most sense for you. And I thought about that every moment of every day, my entire pregnancy. And I remember having a conversation with one of my good friends and she was asking what I was thinking. I was like, honestly, I have no idea. I'll just see how I'm feeling when I'm in there. Like this, I don't think it's something I can plan and I keep going back and forth and I just can't, I can't make a decision because I, who knows what will happen. Like same with the birth plan. Like, I know a lot of people make birth plans. I do not. I'm like just safe baby out of, out of me onto my chest and we're good. Um, so like I, but it was very, anxiety inducing 
and very traumatic to think about. Um, and on the day of the birth, we did what made sense for me. And um, my son was born and he was put in our chest, my chest. And we didn't even realize that while we were like caring for him, my doctor was like, okay, like, you know, we're gonna get your placenta out and we're gonna get, you know, baby girl out and are we gonna get her out again? And I was just like, okay, and like placenta. And, and then she said, if you wanna see the baby, you can, it's not going to be a happy memory. And so I just said like, okay, and that was that. And I think about that a lot, if that was the right choice. I don't know what she looked like or what she seemed like, but from what it, I imagine is that she didn't look much like a person. And I don't know how accurate that is, but I'm just gonna stick with that in my head. <laughs> I felt like, um, and really haven't shared this with anyone really, but, um, I felt like if I saw her, I'd be so stricken by grief that I wouldn't be able to like love my son properly. And like that image of her, because I know she, because the fluid was stuck out of her, she would look very ill. She wouldn't look like a human. Like it's, it would, I was afraid that I would just be focusing on that and not be able to show up well for my son. And I felt good about that decision, but oddly like this last like six months, I've been really, I've struggled a lot with that, with that. Did I make the right choice? And I, you know, have no idea what she was like, but if I would have seen her, I'm sure I would have had, you know, I would have struggled with, should I have not? So, um, yeah. Um, after my son was born, I thought a lot about what life would have been like with his twin. And one baby is so much different than two babies. And what would he have been like? And he's, I know I'm biased because I'm his mother, but also everyone else tells me this too. He's just like the sweetest, most empathetic boy. He'll be three this December. He's the kindest person and most thoughtful person I've ever met. Like when I was itty, when he was itty bitty, I remember there was one night he wouldn't stop crying. And then finally I started crying. He stops and looks at me, kind of like rubs my arm from the time he was little. Like he's just like cares for me. And it makes me think, that like he knows that like he just knew how to care for another being because he shared my womb with someone for nine months and yeah I thought about his twin a lot um and then when my son was born he was sick and um he we were in now the ER for the first six weeks he had an emergency surgery at seven weeks and then when he came back um didn't mean to but we conceived the next baby and we found out when my son was three months that we were pregnant with the baby, that felt stressful. And then shortly after we found out that it was a girl and it felt like we were supposed to have a boy and a girl together. And so my kids are 10 and a half months apart, which is bananas. And it's like the next closest thing you can get to twins. Um, but I had a very difficult time connecting with my daughter and, um, she like really up until like the last six months, like I always, you know, obviously I love her so much and um, spend lots of time with her and she's, she loves being held. So I hold her a lot, but there was just not like me and my son have like this affinity for each other. And I think it's like this idea of like, you've already lived through so much when you're in my womb and you're here and you made it. And this was such a tragic choice, but you are such a light and such like a wonderful human being to the world. My daughter is much more challenging and um, she is going to be a force. And I'm so grateful for that. But I think there's this like tug of war of, there was supposed to be another girl. It's you, I'm so glad it's you. Also, this is so hard. Would my would the twin have been like this? I wonder how she would have been like. And would would you guys have the same personality? Would they have been different? It's like compare and contrast over like this human I never knew. Um, and so you just get into like this wonder world. So it took a really long time to connect with her. Also, my daughter is freaking adorable and so much fun and so freaking smart. And um, she's not even two, and she just like talks a million miles a minute. Obviously, because she's my daughter, and I talk a million miles a minute. Um, so, but it it definitely took some time and a lot of thinking about um yeah what life would have looked like if it was different and I think I'm only just now nearly three years later coming like 
feel settled and in a good spot at play? Um, it just felt like more of a struggle. Like her, because she was a more challenging baby, it felt harder with all the different cries and the sleepless nights. And while I attribute it to connection, it could also be just because I had two babies and they're, you know, one would sleep in the second, in the second that I got like one to sleep, the next one wake up. And as soon as I got this one to sleep, the next, you know, so it like kind of is twin life, but they're just at different stages. And once my son got through a stage, then my daughter was entering that stage. So like all of it was just hard and a struggle. So I'm sure most of it was just natural as far as being overly tired and like burnt out. And we don't, you know, we don't live near family. So we haven't had any help. And then obviously in the pandemic, it's definitely didn't have any help. Um, but I think there's a part of me that's like, yes, it's hard it, because of the closeness and age. Um, and because we, you know, don't have family to help. But I think it's also like, oh, it feels so hard. Like with Kai and he's crying, it's like, oh, you poor baby. It was, and Kai, with my son, when he's crying, it's like, oh, poor kiddo. And when my daughter's crying, I'm like, oh my gosh, it feels more like, ah. Um, and it's only recently changed probably within like the last like six to eight months. Um, and again, I think part of it is just the struggle of having two babies. And part of it is just like that emotional aspect that where I'm still healing and um, didn't have enough time to really get through it before I had the next baby. Um, I've always been big on women's choice and we get to decide and it's no place for anyone else. Um, so that only personified and increased. Um, I didn't realize the different stories that were behind the abortion. And even though I have always been pro-choice and always known that that was an option for me. And I mean, even when I got pregnant with my daughter, one person was like, well, you know, you, you could. And I was like, yeah, like, that's not, that's not what I'm going to do. While I wasn't going to choose that for myself, that should be an option. I should be able to have that choice. And the more I've learned about all of this, about abortions and people's stories. Of course, when you share your story, people come back with their stories. It is imperative. It is, it, you know, we call it reproductive rights because it truly is our reproductive rights. Like you are taking a human right away that no one else should decide it. And it doesn't matter what the reason is. Like my story is a good poster story because for folks who say pro-life, like, well, if I couldn't have had the reduction. It wouldn't be pro-life. I would not have my son either. So it's a good poster story, but like, it doesn't matter. It's, yeah. And it's just shocking to me that there is such a large majority of people who think that the appropriate thing is to tell a person, a woman, whether or not she can have her child. It's, it's mind blowing to me. I like still can't wrap my head around it. They know what's best for them. And while it's helpful to get support um, from other people, ultimately it is not anyone else's choice. So whatever they think is best for you, while they have your best interest at mind, it's you who needs to decide because you are the one that's going to live with it. And whether that means like shutting off your phone and going to a quiet place, or maybe it's like a beautiful place that you enjoy, like the beach, the mountains or near trees, like whatever it is that brings you peace, turn off your phone, keep it at your house from your car, like do like disconnect and just sit with this. And you don't need to make a decision today or tomorrow. Deep in your gut, you know what makes sense for you and like follow that because this isn't like a, a compromise. This is a lifelong decision and you will know what's best. And if today is not the right time for you to be a parent, then there are another opportunity. It's like this isn't this isn't your one and only shot. And if um and if you do want to go through with the pregnancy, incredible, you will be a fantastic parent. Anything that you choose will be the correct thing. I've been very fortunate to have an incredibly supportive and loving and empathetic husband. And I truly could not have imagined a better person to go through this with. And I think about that a lot. I think about all my many ex-boyfriends and how they would have handled this and how I'm just like so grateful that I went through this with this human and not any of those others. Um, we learned a lot about each other. Like I had mentioned earlier, I learned that he likes to be by himself 
when he's struggling and I like to be around people. And so we learned how to manage that. Like at first I was like, ah, like, what? like I need you. And I, why aren't you here? And once we learned what the other person needed, we could take care of ourselves and then take care of each other. And that felt really nice. I think we've taken that with us. And um, our little family has experienced a number of hurdles over the last three years. And um, honestly, it's just phenomenal to me that it sounds so cheesy. So sorry for being so cheesy, but it sound, it, it's so phenomenal to me that we are so in love and we just like, I love hanging out with him. Like I always show friends that he's just like my roommate. And like I come home and I have my roommate to hang out with, but he's, he's a fantastic person to be around. Obviously there's days where I'm like, Oh my God, I cannot like, how, how are we married? How do we get here? <laughs> like, you know, dishes in the sink or something stupid, but it's, I think the most special thing is that I found a partner who really can get the really, really hard things when that was quite literally supposed to be our honeymoon stage where we're just like, in la la land and enjoying each other and everyone's ex everything's exciting and new and we were going to like the deepest of shit and like the lowest of lows and find our way out of it was really incredible um so i we really aren't struggling with anything together because of it because we both were on the same page we talked about it a lot and we were just so in it um and so then we were able to see each other out. And I feel like we were always on the same page. Like while one of us might have a hard day and the other one was feeling better, then we could like console the other person and then it would flip flop. Um, but we both kind of like started to grow out of it at the same time. And certainly being pregnant with my daughter, I think helped us heal as well. Um, and when she was born, my husband just sobbed. And I think it was the idea of like, she's here. Like she just needed a little bit more time and now she's here. And I think that, um, was very lucky. And again, if we won't, didn't have that choice, I wouldn't have either of my two children that are sleeping down the hall right now. And that's wild to me.